to just expect like the air we breathe, Lord. We just know it's there all the time, and yet we never want to take it for granted. We never want to approach it disrespectfully. We never want to um, utilize it, Lord, without realizing that uh, it was demonstrated on the cross and that what you gave to us, that love, the measure of the love, the depth of the love, is in the cross. Therein lies the demonstration of God's love for us. So thanks again, Lord, as we gather together, as brothers can just fellowship with brothers, be in the word, let your Holy Spirit work in us, Lord, and speak to us. And we pray that as we go away every time, that, Lord, our inner man would be renewed, that we would be built up, that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, Lord, in your name we pray that together. Amen. Amen. All right. So hopefully you all got your study for tonight as well as a slice of, or a couple of slices of pizza, guys, that just came in. It's Chris McKee's birthday, and so his wife sent pizza over. We're jazzed about that. A couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, we'll be back here again next Monday, and uh, that'll be the 13th, but on the 20th, and then again on the 27th of December, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Uh, we'll, we're going to have the first, hopefully, annual Christmas bonfire on Sunday the 19th here at the church, starting at 4.30 out in the back. So we're going to have a couple of big bonfires. People are going to bring stew and soup and chili and dessert. So we're going to have some food. We're going to have some fellowship. Should be a neat night, so that'll be a busy Sunday. So we'll take the next Monday off because the following Saturday is Christmas, and then two days later we're going to take that Monday off also because that's going to probably be a very busy weekend for a lot of guys, and it'll probably be just busy time. And then we'll come back on the Monday after New Year's. Then if you can, when we're done with our study tonight, if you can help out, we're going to do what we did last week as we're going to move all the tables and chairs to the side to get prepared for Awana on Wednesday. Pastor Craig is now down in Bishop, senior pastor of Calvary Chapel of Bishop, so he's not on staff, and he's not here on Wednesdays to do that. Him and Wyatt would do that on Wednesday. So if we can go ahead and move those things out today once we're done, then that will be cool. So those are the announcements for us. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Tonight we're going to look at verses 11 through 19. And then, Lord willing, when we get together next week, we're just going to kind of finish out with the last two verses and summarize the book of 1 Timothy. So we've made it almost all the way through the book together. Hopefully it's been informative to you the whole goal was that we would learn to be supporters in the ministry through what paul has written to timothy as he's been teaching timothy how to just manage the ministry and raise up leadership and be aware of the dangers that are out there one of the dangers we saw last week if you were with us were the false teachers that were teaching about money and saying that godliness is a means of gain that, you know, when you're in that spiritual walk and where you need to be, you're in the Lord, you're growing, and God wants to bless you, and financial blessings is a sign of spiritual maturity. It's very much the same like what they have today called the prosperity doctrine, the health and wealth gospel. There's a lot of people on the airwaves, and there's a lot of churches out there that teach that. They teach you that you're a child of God. God wills for you to be rich, to have things, to have stuff, to live large, basically, which is directly heresy. That's what it is. There are those things that we're going to see tonight that God does bless us with, with riches. And riches is not a sin, and being poor is not a virtue. As you go through the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see that. Even though the Lord blesses the poor and James warns the rich and he says it's the poor that are rich in faith and they're rich in faith because they got nothing else and it's kind of 
opens the door and it's like, I got, I got to trust God for everything and anything, man, just my everyday food. Whereas the rich, you know, he said, you guys, you weep and howl because your riches are going to rot. You know, you've just been living in luxury and all those things. So he's looking at those who are rich in an ungodly way. So we're going to kind of cover those things again. But again, he's talking about last week, those that were professing these things. So nothing new in the world, nothing new in the church. Men will find a way whereby they can acquire wealth and possession. We know how they do it in the world, but they will also do it in the church. Like idolatry, and when you think about idolatry, idolatry is usually simply this, the God that men create is a projection of what they would be like if they were God and what they want. You know, the god Bacchus, it was a bull. It was the god that celebrated the wine harvest. And in that celebration, what do you do? You drink wine, you party, you get drunk. And so they created a god that basically facilitated their desire to be drunks. Wherein the Bible says we're not to be drunk. It's a sin. You don't get drunk. But man has done that. You get into Aphrodite and all of the Greek and the Roman gods and goddesses that were fertility goddesses, they called them. They weren't fertility goddesses, they were sex gods. And these gods and the way they worship was sexual immorality because man wanted to participate in sexual immorality. So he projected upon a god that very desire, and so that's the god that they worship. Well, when men want money and wealth and possessions, they're going to create a god who does the same thing. What is it? Well, there are individuals out there, yep, and there are names that could be dropped that unfortunately they project unto God, a God that wants them to be rich, and, and it's a form of idolatry is what it is. When you go to the Word and you pull those things out, it's what we call eisegesis, taking something out of the Word that is not there, okay? You're, 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 you know, or you're trying to put something in there that's not there. It's, it's heresy, it's wrong, and it's a form of idolatry. When we study the Word, we want the Jesus that the Word projects to us that is there, not the Jesus of the lifestyle and the living that we want to live. So there's really nothing new. And so Paul warning Timothy, they're going to create a doctrine that justifies their beliefs. We were talking about this a little bit earlier where, you know, what do people do with certain verses? Well, they just minimize those verses. What do you do with verses like we're going to cover tonight? They minimize them or sometimes they prioritize other verses in the Bible that basically negate the verses that they don't want. And they imagine because they believe in this promise and it's, it's such a wonderful promise that the other one somehow must not mean what it's saying and it's got to become subservient to the verse that they, they elevate. And that's bad theology when you start doing that. You know, the, the, the Bible has to have balance and, and the Scripture has to, in a sense, I call it, be linear. Everything has to line up. You can't take stuff and kick it out and then continue on. You can't take the alphabet and remove the Q and the Z and, and the letters. You don't like that much. They all have to fit in there somehow. And there has to be a balance. And so when you start eliminating them or minimizing them, you're going to come up with bad theology. We see here the love of money is a root of a variety of evils, Paul said. It, it just There's all kinds of evils that come out of the love of money. They're going to arise and the problem was, Paul said, it's their greediness. And we see that back in verse 10. They've strayed from the faith in their greediness. We saw that those were both for the elder and the deacon qualifications, right? They could not be greedy. And they remain qualifications today in leadership. You cannot be greedy. You cannot be money driven. And so when you see these guys in their greedy, you know, they're not following, again, that's, They've eliminated that verse, or they don't see it as greed. They Again, they retranslate it as God's will for their life to be blessed. So as he warned them about those things then, he's going to continue on basically through verse 19. with with Now, the subject is somewhat going to be about riches in a way and, and the dangerous guys. But when we get to the other side of the riches, you're going to see that the Lord allows people to be rich. In fact, they're rich because He has made them rich. And for some people, that doesn't make sense. 
But again, we want to see the balance of God's view on money and riches. And so as we've looked at this, these guys have erred from the faith, strayed from the faith in greediness. They have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Verse 11. Now back to Timothy. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. But you as opposed to them and unlike them. Who? The greedy guys. The guys who are taking the Word of God and using it and teaching it in a way so they can just get money and stuff. I've noticed there's always people that are going to follow that theology because really, would you agree that is kind of the essence of culture in America? It's the drive for materialism. It's the drive to be successful. It's the drive to get. And if you think about it a lot, everything we do kind of in life for the average person, not the Christian, because we know how to balance those things. But if you think about it, we, we, we do that. As we grow up, we're looking for a job that will pay the bills. We're then looking for a job that we could make money. Then we're looking for a job that makes better money, that makes more money, that has better benefits, that has retirement packages, that has perks. That you know, and, and, and there's nothing wrong in that initially, in that stuff. Our kids start growing up, and as pops, we start thinking, well, I want my kid to be successful. I want them to be happy. I want them to have a good job. I want them to have stuff. I don't want them to live poor. And we tell them, go to school, get an education, you know, get a career, pursue it. How are you doing? Are you thinking about a better job? You know, you don't have this. You may want to look for an occupation, a vocation that has that. And so we're, we're always pushing in that direction to be financially successful. And that's just kind of the essence of our culture. And then materialism. You know, we live in a time where marketing product is an art form. And now with internet, I mean, the, you know, you, you Google something and you go online and you click something. I, I went, I, this is old stuff, but I just think I was looking at a meat grinder. Cabela's sends me the, you know, little ad and I go online and this is what's on sale. And I thought, oh, food processing, meat grinders. We're looking for a nice big commercial, not commercial, but pro grade meat grinder. So I click it on and oh, there's one. It's on sale. I'm thinking about it. I was mentioning it to Mike the other day and all of a sudden, I go back two days later and says, you were looking at this one. And I knew what it was. I click it on it. There's the meat grinder again. And two days later, you know, are you still it? You know, they know. They, they've got it set up where now they can track me. I've heard of people who say I've said something near Siri, and next thing you know, it pops up on my phone, an ad for the very thing we were talking about moments ago. That's spooky right there. That, yeah, ain't <laughs> that? That's right. They're listening to you. Yeah. 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 And so with it, they're letting, you know, you need this, you want that, you have to have this. And I think I mentioned that too, that commercial ad I've always loved where the guy's driving down the street in his convertible. He's got the new T3 computer in the big, big PC box on his seat. And as he pulls up to the, the light and he stops, and he looks up, the guy on the billboard sign's going like this and he's got the T4 and he looks at the thing next to him like, it's archaic already. You know, you need another one. You need a bigger one. You need a better one. You need a faster one. You need a lighter one. You need a smaller one. You need, you need, you know, these are nicer. These are cooler. These are sharper. These are prettier. These are faster. There, there's always, that they, they're just skilled at making us feel unsatisfied with what we have. They make things that don't last. So you have to get another one. But you paid five times more for the one that didn't last than the one that did last. So th that's just the world. And so in order to get that stuff, you got to make money and, and so it, 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 it's just a really convoluted drive that you and I as believers have to think about these things. Well, the greedy man will, will, will go in that direction, and these guys that teach this stuff, they're going to have people. And they're going to be advocates and, and proponents, and they're going to be supporters, they're going to be followers, because that's what the world's doing. They're already in that momentum. Now all they got to do is transition over into a religious realm and now God's going to help them fulfill and satisfy the goal of that. And then they become subject to all kinds of strange theologies and beliefs. And, and they stop searching the scripture for truth. 
They just follow these guys. And when you listen to them, they always seem to get on the same track. No matter where they go in their teaching, somehow it all ends up traveling back to, you know, you, you should be blessed and a sign of God's blessing in your life is going to be prosperity. It's what he wants for you. So that's, that's what you go. So he says, but you as opposed to them. And then he calls Timothy, O oh, man of God. And that is out of Paul's norm. But remember, when he opened up the book, he called Timothy my true son in the faith. So Timothy is Paul's protege. He's, he's his disciple. He's his spiritual clone, hopefully, if you will. And he calls him, oh, man of God. You're my son in the faith, but oh, man of God. In the Old Testament, Elijah, Samuel, David in the book of Nehemiah, Moses in Deuteronomy, they were called a man of God, men of God. David also was called a man, what? After God's own heart, both in 1 Samuel and again in the book of Acts. So in the Old Testament and the New Testament, a man after God's own heart, and he was a man of God. We always begin with and we always come back to you and I, I'm a man of God. That sounds a little weighty when you say, I'm a man of God. That's almost like arrogant, isn't it? It's almost like you think so, really? Yeah, but no. You have to be able to say, I'm a man of God. That, that's what I accept. I, I confess Christ. I follow the Lord. The goal of my life is, is to be a man of God. That, that should be what people think of me when they see me in the world, at work, in the neighborhood, with the family. And I'm talking about regular people. You know, there are those antagonists out there. You, you could do all the right things in the kingdom and you'll always be just a religious fanatic. But the average person should look at us and think, well, that, that's, that's the man of God. That's a guy who follows Jesus. He's a, he's a follower of of the Lord, because we, we've accepted the call to be a man of God. We've confessed those things, and, and now we have to continue all the time to live this life. So when Paul calls Timothy a man of God, I think the Lord looks at you and says, O man of God, Tom. O man of God, Merle. O man of God, Shane. O man of God, Chris on his birthday. All of us. He looks at you, O man of God. And so we, we want to live up to that, and that's what Paul is teaching Timothy here to make sure that he is living up to that. These guys aren't men of God. They believe they have godliness and they're getting gain and they're financially successful, but they're not men of God. They're men of the flesh. They're men that are following their own passions and not following the right things. And so he says to them, O men of God, flee these things and pursue. The idea of flee these things is run away quickly. I think if you've gone through the book of Genesis, you remember Joseph, the son of Jacob, and he got sold into slavery, came across Potiphar, man of rank and position, and he saw something in Joe that, hey, I like this guy. You know, he's, he's in my prison, and you know, I'm watching this guy, but he's, he's pretty good. Hey, how would you like a job at my house managing the house? You got it, boss. Potiphar went about his business, and one day Mrs. Potiphar said, Hey, cutie, how are you? And she started hitting on Joe. And all of a sudden, one day, she just went a little too far and, and then grabbed Joe's clothes and held it tight, and he bailed naked. He ran quickly away. He, he fled. He got out of Dodge. He did whatever he had to do to go the other direction. So that's what Paul's saying to Timothy right here, man. You've got to flee. You've got to run away quickly from the love of money. Run away from greediness. Run away from the pursuit of riches when that's your drive and your goal. Run away from all the evils that arise from the love of money. What do you need to have to help you flee? Gee, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> conscience. Got to have conscience, right? Because your conscience is, hey, Gil, you, you, you're getting a little hungry for a buck. Hey, Gil, you're 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 going to do something a little questionable right there and unethical because you, you you're you're seeing an opportunity right there. 
somebody, James says, somebody comes into your assembly, got a nice ring, nice robe, got some cash. Hey, God bless you, man. Welcome. What's your name? Hi, I'm Gil. Good to meet you, man. Oh, you're new in these parts. Well, welcome. Well, good to have you. They were well, driving a nice brand new truck. What's well, about 80000 Hey, he must have cash, you know. And suddenly you realize that what you would be doing is you're befriending this person because you realize he, he's got some cash and somewhere, somehow, and maybe, possibly, and you never know. And, oh, you know, it's going to be an open door from the Lord. But the reality is greediness says, you're, you're making a friend out of somebody because you're looking to get something from them. And, and it can happen. It can happen with people with position, with wealth, with connection. You know, we're looking to, to set ourselves up. So I think, again, it, it, it has to have, the conscience has to be able to be used by the Holy Spirit to say, that's unethical. You're moving in the wrong, wrong direction. And so you don't want to do those things for those reasons. So flee these things. And yet he, then he says, Pursue. I think of fleeing. I think you want to flee these things like a criminal wants to flee the scene of a crime as he hears the units coming code three. That's what it means to flee. Get out of here. You're going to get busted. Run. But pursue now, I think of it as the officer who arrives on scene first and he sees the suspect, matches the description, and he's heading north on that street. And what does that officer do? Pursues. <laughs> now it's against a lot of <laughs> Well, the good ones like Mike, pursue, whether in unit or on foot. Now, now the chase is on and, and the goal is to get the bad guy. So flee these things, get out of there, but now you, you pursue and the idea is to chase, to apprehend. So you're running from those, but you're running to these. And I think the Christian life is scarcely static. In your life, you're either... Fleeing or pursuing? Or you're not fleeing and you're not pursuing. You're, you're doing one or the other. It's like I've always thought the Christian walk is always going uphill because it's, it's a challenge, right? It's, 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 it's work. But this hill is lightly greased. And, and you're moving. And as long as you're moving, you're going uphill. You may not be going up as fast as you want, but you're going uphill. Can you stop? You can for a second, but all of a sudden, what happens? Yeah, you start, what do they call that? Ah, yeah, backsliding. Sliding backwards because the hill's kind of greased. That's just the way it is. So it doesn't mean, oh, I missed Sunday. I must be backsliding. Oh, I didn't read my Bible this week. I must be backsliding. I haven't prayed in three days. That's not, that. that is just a lot of times Life, busy, neglect, forget, senility, laziness, can be. But when, when you just think you can stop for a while and take a break, you're, you're, you're going the wrong direction. You're not pursuing anymore. That means you're not fleeing either. So Christianity isn't static. There's no plateaus in Christianity you don't say, you know what, all I want to do is grow to this point in my walk and I'm just going to plateau out and camp here at this elevation. It's not. It, it, it's always until Jesus gets us or we get to the kingdom, it's always an uphill trek. And, and when you stop, and we know, well, if you stop going to church, what happens? You stop reading the Word. You stop praying. You stop fellowshipping. You stop serving. If you stop doing anything that the Lord has brought you to, you just start seeing in your own personal walk, it's not the walk you used to have. It's not the walk that you want. And, and it could be a subtle form of backsliding. You're, you're, you're going. So remember, the Christian walk is, is never static. It's just, it, it never does that. It's, it's always that upward ascent on the greased hill. So Paul is telling Timothy, flee those things, but pursue. And he lists several things that Timothy is to pursue and we should pursue too. These things that we're going to pursue that the world puts little value on godly virtues at all. You know, they, they don't see these things as necessary, but for you and me as men of God, there are wealth, there are riches, there are treasures. They're the things that you and me want to be able to say, these are things that are kind of 
norms in my life. I'm not perfect at them. I don't have them down all the time. But I know that I dwell within them most of the time. They're going on in me most of the time. That's the walk of the Spirit because these are fruits of the Spirit. When you look at these six, you can actually find four of them in the fruits of the Spirit You know, as we go through them. We know there's love. We know there's patience. We know there's gentleness. And, and godliness is just like goodness, the fruit of the Spirit, goodness. Because goodness means godness, and godliness is godlikeness. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So really, they're just fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit is the Spirit working in your life, cultivating in you these fruits, and they just become you. What was your personality like before Jesus? What would people say about you? Yeah, they may say things, ah, standoffish, ah, unfriendly, hot-headed, ill-tempered, rude, wicked, oh, profane, man, sinner, cusser, oh, liar, liar, thief, thief, all those kinds of things. But when you become a Christian, what do they say about us? Really, they should be using the fruits of the Spirit to describe us. Now, the guy, yeah, he's, guy's got a lot of love. The guy seems to just have joy. There's just a peace about the dude. You know? He's got a long suffering about him. He's, he's kind. He's got a goodness. He, he's faithful. Yeah, he's gentle. Dude's got self control. Fruits of the Spirit. You know, they, those should just be kind of the norms to our personality. And like I say, we always aren't at our 10 game, our A game. But most of the time, they should just really be the, the workings out of the Spirit in our life. So six of them. Righteousness. And I just try to make it simple. Rightness. What is righteousness? It's just rightness. That's the root of the word. Living rightly. What is right to God is right to me. What He says is right is right. What He says is wrong is wrong. You follow that simple rule, you're going to be living righteously because it's right. You're doing real simple what's right. So we don't want to make the word too, you know, wow, righteousness. There is the work of God in righteousness that we can't touch. He gives unto us the righteousness of Christ Jesus through faith. But now I'm to walk in righteousness. How do I do that? Just do what's right. Do what's right. Find out what God says is right. Not too bad after all. Then you got godliness, and I put down there, it's just godlikeness. That's what godliness, godlikeness. Jesus modeled it right when he came down in human form. Phil, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Show us the Father. You see it. Watch. Like, so Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What is that? Godlikeness. Just, you know, so for us should be able to do that. I like what Pastor Gary says. It's not what would Jesus do, but what did D Jesus do? And that's how you can be God-like. You know, how did he act in that circumstance? What was his reaction in that circumstance? How did he handle those people in that circumstance? The religious people were bugged because he didn't handle the common people the way they wanted him to. He eats with sinners and tax collectors. We don't like those sinners. We don't hang around with them. Jesus was drawn to them. And then he told them, guys, these guys are sick. You are healthy. The, the healthy don't need a physician. They need them. Jesus, Moses said in the law, stone this woman. What do you say? Jesus wrote the law. Jesus gave the law to Moses. He could have got up and said, amen. So be it. Nail her. But he didn't. He, he showed compassion on this woman. Of course, we know they all left. And he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Where are those that are condemning you? I don't know, Lord. Well, I'm not going to condemn you either. Go on. Don't sin no more. Stop that. But you can go. So we look at stuff like that and we think, how does Jesus handle people? You know, blind Bartimaeus. Jesus, David, son of David. Hey, shut up, man. Be quiet. It's Jesus. That's what they told him. Be quiet, man. And he yelled all the more. And Jesus stopped and said, bring that guy over to me. Bart? What can I do for you? Oh, Lord, that I can see. Your faith has made you whole, buddy. You can see. You know, and, and the Lord did stuff like that, and the religious leaders didn't like him. He healed on the Sabbath. 
But he touched the guy with the withered arm and he healed him, the demon-possessed guy. And he healed him. And it bugged them. But it's what Jesus did. So we got to think about that too because sometimes even the religious community has a way that they think we should act towards sinners. we got to be careful that we follow what Jesus does and, and be like him and, and love the unlovely. He leaves the 99 for the one. You know, that's Jesus. That's God-likeness. Faith. That's something else you need to pursue, Timothy. Faith. Trust. Belief that obeys. Belief that follows. When I can't understand it, when I can't see it, when I can't feel it, faith says I still obey it. I still follow it. You know, and that's... that's and we have Hebrews 11.1 1 right there, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It's not tangible. It's not visible. It's not feelable. It's not measurable. But you know you, you have to move forward. Uh, I like to duck hunt. Anybody here like to duck hunt? We don't have duck hunters around here. It's just not duck hunting territory. I love to duck hunt. So when you duck hunt, you have to have a good duck hunting dog. You have to have a retriever. Sometimes the water's too deep. Sometimes there's a canal in the way you can't get through. So if you don't have a dog, you don't get your quarry. So I've trained labs for duck hunting. And one of the things you have to do when you train a dog, when I bring my dog home on day 49, comes home on day 49 of his birth. And for three nights, I sleep with my puppy lab. I become mama to him. It's nothing I ever read. It's something that I figured this is logical to me. I'm taking him from mama because he uses his nose to smell her. And when I pull her, her warm body is no longer there. And I'm going to be with him for three nights in a row. I sleep with him, usually against the couch. I put a C like that. I trap him in there. He can't go nor He has to stay with me for three nights all day long. And for the first 30 days, nobody can feed him but me. So I bond with that little guy. It's always a male. I'm a male dog lover. And then when I begin to train my dog, I do something. And you guys can try and do this. You'll have fun. Teach a dog to sit at your side and to leave your side for no reason. Will a dog do that? Won't leave your side for no reason. If you tell your dog, go, and there's no ball, throw. if you throw a ball, he sees the ball, he'll get the ball, right? But to get a dog who's sitting at your side to give him a command, back, or bird, for him, he'll never do it. Unless you teach a dog to do it. So what you're doing when you're training a lab, to do that, you're teaching him faith in your command. I'm going to ask you to go that way, and you've never seen nothing out there, but you believe me so much that you know when I say back, I'm going to control you, but if I say bird, not only are you going out there, but what you love to get is out there, and a dog loves to retrieve the bird for you. So I'll just say back, and he'll run like that, and he'll run to a point, and I'll blow my whistle, give it one strong blast, and he'll turn and sit and look at me. Because that's his next command. And he's waiting. I trust you to tell me what to do now. So to his right, there's a bumper or a dead duck. So I pick up my left hand and I go like that. And the first thing my dog will do is he'll look to his right. Because he knows what that means. There's going to be a second command that follows. Over. And that's all I do. And he's waiting for me to do that. When I do that, he runs that way. Because he's been trained. He trusts me. And he'll go that way till he picks the scent. And he'll pick up the bird and he'll come back. And what you teach your dog is whenever I send you, whenever I command you, there is what you want over there. And that's faith. And that's what the Lord does with you and me. The Lord said to Abraham, Abraham, go where I tell you. Back. Did he tell Abraham where to go? He didn't tell Abraham where to go. He just said, Abraham, go that way. Leave her the Chaldees, leave your family. Abraham, back. And Abraham went. And that's the way it is with you and me. God's going to say, do this, and you're thinking, is that the Lord? Why would I do that? What? You don't see nothing. Nothing looks logical. What, 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 why? And a lot of times the Lord just says, just take a step to here. And I think sometimes when you're, you're standing here, you're thinking, I don't see the answer, Lord. Take a step, Gil. I don't see the answer. Take another step, Gil. I don't see. Oh, oh, well, well yeah, now I see what you want, Lord, because now he's changed and he's moved you along. He's got a new perspective. And so we're, we're pursuing faith in the Lord all the time. We're following the Lord all the time. The next one he says is love. John 13, 34. New commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you love one another, he said. 
That's the new commandment, love. So brothers, we're to love one another the way Jesus loves us. And I think this is big for the church. I think the body of Christ, we always have to be refreshed in what it means to love because I think, ah, gosh, I don't know how to describe it. I think sometimes we get in a love rut. You know, we, we just, it, it's easy to feel like we're loving people because we're loving some of the people. But really, are, are we loving one another in, in, a, in a tangible way? You know, we love the lovely. We look at some people and we go, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah or Joe, yeah, I can, yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that. And, you see, and they see some people and they go, ooh, I don't know. I love these guys over here. These are great guys. So we love the love. We love the lovable. Some people just are the kind of people when they they act. You just oh, you, I can love them. And some people when they behave and you watch them, they're not the kind of people that are lovable. And then there are the lovers, those that love you. Oh, they love me. They're nice to me. Well, I I can love them guys. Oh, what great. Oh yeah. Hey, how you doing? Well, thank you, thank you. But what about the unlovely? What about the unlovable? What about the people that don't? They have, some people have kind of a leave me alone behavior. What do you do with them? Get out of my face. What do you do with them? Jesus said, you guys love each other the way I loved you. And I can't believe that these 12 apostles are the kind of guys that Jesus went, this is going to be a good group of guys. I've selected some cream of the crop fellas, man. These guys are going to be cool. Because when we go through and we look at the guys, they're not, and we know on three different occasions they argued amongst themselves who was the greatest. They were a typical group of 12 male dudes. And Jesus loved them till when? Till the end. Jesus loved them when he knew they would deny him, when they knew they would run and leave him. And he still loved them. His love didn't change. He washed the feet of the men who had run that night. He washed the feet of the man who would walk and be his betrayer. Woe to those who feet are swift to shed blood. And Judas Iscariot, fulfilling the proverb, Jesus washed his feet before he went out, and he did that. What you do, do quickly, Judas. Go do it. Go go get it done. And so he, he loved these guys. And so for us, brothers, we, we have to love like that. We have to have that kind of a natural Jesus love for one another. We have to let brothers do things that step on our toes. And we still have to love the brother. We don't get to go, oh, clown stepped on my toes. That Christian is that, man. I love the brother. He stepped on my toes. I got nothing to do with him. Let me move along. No, we don't. Brother steps on our toes. Says, hey, I stepped on your toes. Hey, you stepped on my toes. I'm sorry about that. Oh, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. And we love. We're the body of Christ. We're a, we're a different group of brothers. So we don't want our love to, to, get, to get stagnant. We don't want our love to, to get in a rut. We want to keep it fresh like Jesus. Patience or endurance. You stay the course in the storm even though you want to bail. You hold the position in the fight. You want to run and flee. You have composure in the conflict because you want to blow it. And you retain self-control in the crisis even though you want to you want to lash out. You have that patience. That's a challenging one right there, isn't it? You know, Timothy, have patience. Pursue patience. We always joke, never pray for patience. You know, because God will give it an opportunity for you to exercise it. Might as well jump into that pond, boys, and learn how to swim in it because it's going to come. You know, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're to be patient with each other and certainly patient waiting on what the Lord's going to do. Gentleness, that's a great one. Not using force to control others, not rendering evil for evil, and using compassion instead of frustration. You know, when people know that something went wrong, they did something bad, and you probably are going to get ticked. You just come in and just, hey, brother, well, you know, those things kind of happen and stuff. Love begins to reign. Loving like Jesus loves, like he loved the guys. And then you just handle it in a gentle way. You don't need to, you know, get hot-headed and upset and use words that are crude and rude and act like a bad dude. Just, it's, it's throughout the Bible. Servant of the Lord cannot be argumentative, but has to be gentle. Jesus said, learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. So Jesus said, I'm gentle. I handle people with gentleness. Now, when the Pharisees went where they went, 
We can handle them in a different fashion. But for the most part, Jesus was gentle with everybody. Jesus was kind with everybody. Could you imagine if Jesus used the power that was at his disposal with people? When he left Capernaum and their lack of faith, you know, and Bethsaida, when he said, boy, it's better for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it's going to be for you guys, he could have left the city. Remember in Samaria when James and John said, Lord, should we call down fire out of heaven? And he said, you know, I had the same idea, guys. Let's the three of us do it together, man. Let's just smoke them. Aren't we glad Jesus didn't do stuff like that? What do I have to do with you, sons of thunder? You guys are just, wow. And so he was gentle even with the people who rejected him. So that's what we're pursuing. Thoughts, questions, comments on those six fruits of the Spirit? Joe. Didn't do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's the Holy Spirit in your life. Spirit in your life, because like you say, what you normally want to do in a default reaction is simply just let him know that you know he's an idiot and educate him. But what my job at the pharmacy, I get people like that all the time. They're they're um, extremely agitated. It's 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 a little stinker of a spot to be because you know their insurance didn't go through. The cost of the medication is high. They're not feeling really good. My technician down there at the other window told him it'd be 30 minutes and 45 minutes later they come and I'm looking on my screen and they ain't halfway through the process yet. I said, you know, you're probably 20, 30 minutes out. Now they're lit up and mad at me and saying things. And I had one guy call me, cuss, oh, you know, and it just, I, I, I get like that too. Man, I, I can think of some great stuff to say back, you know, but, you know, you plexiglass. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, and I'll just confess, I think we're all like that, you know, but we know what the Lord wants us to do. We know how we should be. We're, we're supposed to be gentle. Jesus was gentle, so I'm sure we all have, for this week, two or three testimonies we can give on somebody who lit our short fuse and how we wanted to explode, but the Holy Spirit put the water on the firecracker real quick. We didn't. So... We're pursuing those things. And he says in verse 12, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. When you drive down the 395 towards Reno, and I think it's Renown has a big poster up there that says, Fight the good fight. Anybody seen that one? Isn't it Renown or something like that? Yeah, and you got the guy up there, and I guess he's fighting a, a medical battle or something. I see. Fight the good fight. And I always think, well, you know, fight the good fight of faith. That's the good fight, and that's where you get it right here. Where, uh, Paul is telling Timothy that your walk in Christianity is a fight. You know, it, it, it is just that uh, it's, a, it's a fight against sin and the flesh. If you haven't realized it yet, in your life, in my life for sure, I'm always fighting the flesh. Good example, when the flesh wants to pop up, we have to let the spirit reign. That's what pastor taught. You know, if you walk in the spirit, you're going to have life. If you walk in the flesh, it's death. So we want spiritual life. So you and I are always fighting our flesh. We're fighting our attitude. We're fighting what level of anger we have and, and the way we react. Paul said that I discipline my body daily and I bring it under subjection. I buffet my body, and then the word in the Greek is I black eye my body. I, I just, because Paul himself, being a Pharisee, and we saw what he was like, he breathed out threats and slaughters against the church. Paul, I think, was a hot-headed, extremely prideful, maybe even to the point of brutal, angry, 
vicious guy. I mean, boy, Paul had the chance, he'll come and get you Christians, and he did it. And so I think Paul, by nature, wasn't that little just sweet, mellow, gentle, friendly, pacifistic kind of little... No, Paul, he, in his life as a Pharisee, man, he may have, you know, just been a rough guy. And I think he was from what we see in the Scripture. Now he's a believer, and he says, i got to buffet my body daily. There's all kinds of things in, in my flesh that just want to jump up, so I'm in a fight against my flesh every day. Not only a fight against the flesh, you, you're in a fight against the world and the culture. You're fighting the good fight against the world. John said, love not the world, neither the things of the world, in First John. And so you're in a fight against, and, and that's the materialism and all the philosophies of the world and all the things they're trying to get us to be like them that we know are in opposition to our spiritual walk. So we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a fight against the world. We're in a fight against the culture. You know, the culture now has its own philosophies about life, about living, and about everything. And we know that they're opposed to the Word of God. So because of your, you're in that fight, they hate you. And that's why Jesus said, you know, they hated me first. If they hated you, remember, they hated me first. And now the culture is going to hate you because... You're in conflict with the way they think and what they believe and how they want to live and what they want to do. Your light, your salt, your conviction, you know, and, and they know that. They know you're walking with the Lord and you have the spiritual life. And if you can remove all of those that convict us of sin, there's less conviction and it makes our conscience feel a lot better. So they hate you. I look at the world today where they use a lot of terminology, you know, you're bigots, you're hateful, you know, all the terminology, and that is to silence people who want to speak the truth. So the world hates us. So we're in a fight against the world. Now we're in a fight against the devil. Ephesians 6.12 says we wrestle against spiritual host of wickedness. Demonic, satanic, Battles all the time. When Frank Preddy first came out with this present darkness and he started this Christian novel thing that we have now, and there's been so many ever since, but really that book, when it first came out, this present darkness, and he had a sequel to it, um, Beyond Piercing the Darkness, thank you, I knew it was another darkness one. And it was the first novel I read. I'm not a novel kind of guy. There's a, there's a lot of good books on reality, fact, and theology and, and, and that I would, I would spend my time reading, but I just decided to read his book, and it was cool. I think it just made people start thinking about the spiritual battle in some of his writing. He, he tried to make us realize that right now in this room, there's demonic entities influencing, influencing our hearts, our minds, our thoughts. Jesus said the seed's getting sowed. They're trying to steal the seed, trying to make our heart hard in certain areas so we don't listen to the Word of God. And so there's that, that battle going on all the time. You're in a battle against Satan. Jesus prayed that the Father would keep us from the evil one. So he can't have power over us, but he's still trying to influence us. So we're in that constant spiritual battle all the time and, and fighting the devil. So we're to fight the good fight of faith. We're going to see in 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul will say, I fought the fight, I ran the race, I kept the faith. Why? Because he said, the time of my departure is at hand, Timothy. I'm in prison. Nero has given the sentence, death by beheading. I'm going to be beheaded. So it's over, Tim. Now, I believe by the time Timothy read the words of 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul was in glory. By the time that letter probably traveled in the speed that it did in those days, pro probably got the word maybe a day or two later, some messenger came and just said, hey, Timothy, just want to let you know that Paul went to be with Jesus you know, a week and a half ago. And Timothy would think, wow, I just got the letter. A couple of days, you know, I, just, I just read it. You mean he was gone when I read? Yeah, he, he had fought the fight. He, he ran the race and he kept the faith and he had departed. When he wrote, the time of my departure is near, it wasn't a text. Timothy didn't get it in, you know, moments. 
It wasn't a letter that Timothy can get from the other side of the world by mail in what? Seven to 11 days maybe? No, it's one that would have to be handled to somebody who had walked to here and maybe ride a donkey to there and then get on a boat to here, to there, to there. And it may have taken two to three months to get to Timothy. And so he was gone already, but he, he kept the faith and he fought the fight. Paul was a great spiritual warrior, so now we're to do the same thing. We're fighting the good fight. We're laying hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and had, have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So Paul said, Timothy, you have confessed the good confession before many people. Timothy no doubt confessed his faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He no doubt confessed his belief in the authority and the inerrancy of the Word of God. He confessed his commitment to the ministry and to the service of the body. I'm sure Timothy, and, and he traveled with Paul. So with Paul at many times, in many places, and to many people, Timothy with Paul could make that confession of what he believed in the Lord and who he was in the Lord. And so he reminds him, fight that good fight of faith. The one that you were called to, and you've confessed it in the presence of many witnesses. A lot of people have heard you. And I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in inapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So Paul gives Timothy another charge. I urge you or I charge you, and and it's another strong one. Remember in 521, before God, before Jesus, and before the elect angels, I give you this charge that you show no partiality to any man. And now he gives him another one. Before God the Father and before Jesus, Timothy, I'm urging you, you got to keep this charge. You know, you got to pursue righteousness, man. You got to keep the good confession. You've got to fight the good fight till Jesus comes for the church, till Jesus comes for you. The older you get, the less you expect to go up in the rapture and the more you anticipate when the chariot swings low. And it's time for you to board. That chariot's got your name on it. The angels come to take you home alone. And the church is going to have to rise without you, but they'll meet you up there. The older we get, you know, I'm 64. Chris turned 81 today. Was it 81, Chris, you turned today? (laughs) Only 71. Only 71. Uh, Give me a look of love. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Uh, I could be the subject of that matter. <laughs> but it's it's true, you know, and I think about it, I think heart attack could have happened yesterday. Uh, you know, you can get the doctor's report. It, it, it's so close. It, the older you get it, you know, you guys, you're thinking, okay, you're, you know, you're not even halfway through it, and you got more ahead of you than behind you. And we look at it, and we, go, we don't have much ahead of us. You know, we wonder. You start thinking about how old your dad lived and where your health is at and what's going on. You know, and you, you start calculating how close is it before the steeds come out of the heavenly stalls and get hooked up to my chariot. And, and I realize it. And then there's a car accident. You know, I was at Costco that day and people were coming in and talking about this massive accident. And two people that day would die in this nine car vehicular melee that went on right there. You don't know. You're just heading to the market. You have no idea be the last drive to the market you'll ever take. There's just these various things that go on in life, and you just think, all the more I'm getting closer to the trip home. And there's a, a soberness about it, and there's an excitement about it. To think, imagine that. Could you imagine tomorrow I'd be with Jesus? Tomorrow you'll hear that you ain't going to believe what happened to Gil. Remember what he was talking about last night? Craziest thing, man. He was on his way. just like, And I'll be in heaven going, oh, wow, Pastor Chuck, I've missed you so much. You know, and Abraham. And, and you, you know, you'll be just blown away. I'll be blown away. You'll be stuck down here all by yourself in this muck and mire. Or it might be you. 
But uh, keep it until Jesus appears. And then he, I love Paul, he just blows into this phenomenal doxology again, glorifying the Lord and, you know, just declaring, you know, he made the good confession in front of Pontius Pilate, but Pilate isn't the potentate. Jesus is the potentate. And if you realize it comes from the word potent, which comes from the word powerful. Jesus is the powerful one, not man. Of all the kings, Jesus is the king. Of all the lords, and Caesar called himself Lord, Jesus is the Lord. And only he has immortality. It has the idea of both invincibility and unkillability. He nailed him to a cross. When it was all done, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Guys, I'll be back in three days. And he rose from the dead. He can't kill Jesus. He's invincible. He's immortal. He's untouchable. All these superheroes in the movies and all those things. <sighs> nah. I love it, man. He's the immortal one. He dwells in an approachable light that no man has seen or can see. He dwells at the throne of the Father, at the right hand of the Father, and to him be honor and everlasting power. Now, the next couple of verses, several verses we look at, he's going to return back to the rich. Now, notice this. Command those who are rich in this present age to repent from this sin to sell all that they have, give it to the poor, take a vow of poverty, and really be holy. And some people think that. But no, he said, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. He warned in verse 9 about those who desire to be rich. Now he has given a command to those who are rich. Question is, at what point are you rich? And it's been the suggestion that in America, we live at the top 5% of the richest people in the world, the people who live at the poverty level and beyond. So globally, everybody in the room is very, very rich compared to the world. You may not feel that way in this culture, but it's funny, no matter how much you make, you just don't feel that rich. You could be in six figures. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't call myself really rich. Yeah, we're, we're well to do. We're well off. We got a lot of stuff. So to those who are rich, don't be proud. Don't be haughty, you know. Um, don't be arrogant. Don't be prideful. Don't think because you got more, you are more. Don't think because they got less, you can now treat them as less. Don't be haughty. And then don't trust in your riches. Trust in God. Because they're uncertain. Haven't we learned that in this day and age? We saw that at the Great Depression. We saw men who went out on cruises as rich men and they came back broke as paupers. The suicide went up because they lost all their holdings. Today the market can swing and turn the other way. And men who have their investment in the market, suddenly it just, the bottom falls out. They have a bear market and wipes out. Everything just falls. Things can change real quick. Mergers, corporate buyouts. Uh, COVID has shut down so many businesses, haven't it? You know, there's product that you can't get on the shelf. And I say, what happened? I bet you COVID, with all the things that go on, it it just shut them down. So riches, there's no guarantee they'll be here tomorrow. Proverbs 23.5 says, riches make themselves wings and fly away. So there's a lot of ways that money can quickly fade away. We trust in God because God gave us the riches in the first place. Like Job, he chooses to give. He might choose to take them away. Blessed be the name of the Lord either way. That's not an easy thing to do when you're in it, when you realize suddenly, uh uh-oh, my outgo is so much greater than my income. I got a problem here. What do you do? You got to trust in the Lord. You got to go to the Lord. And then the next verse it says, or this one here it says, but we trust in God who gives us richly all things to enjoy so god is the one paul is saying to these rich people god has given you your riches to enjoy so having riches being rich is not a sin it's not wrong pursuing it making it a priority that's sin you're in trouble you're in danger some men are rich because they have very good money management they're very wise and they handle their money properly some men came into the church and got saved as rich men Some men within the church learned the biblical method of money management and became rich and did better. And God blessed those. And so he's saying 
I've given you these things to enjoy. So the guy who has the RV, he can enjoy the RV God gave it to him or the boat or, or whatever it is. There are things that, that the Lord allows us to do that we love. We can enjoy them. I love to hunt. I love hanging with my brothers when we go hunting. The fellowship is rich. I love where we go, the sunrises that we saw, the pictures and, and the landscapes that you see. I love it out there. And then every once in a while, he blesses, and, and you get what you went out to go get. You got the animal, the meat you saw. He, that's a blessing from the Lord, too. So I, I get to go out. I come, That is a blessing. That, to me, is, is riches. If, if that's where my riches lie, if I could do that several times a year, I'm happy camper, man. I, I don't need a condo anywhere in the world or a Rolex watch or nothing like that. I just get me out in, in the woods and in the country and in the remote and with some brothers and some fellowship and some creative beauty. And for me, that's riches, man. That's I'm in, I'm a happy camper right there. That's that's a good place to be. Lots of elk running around, mule deer, and I got tags for everybody. And like with every blessing, we want to make sure we worship the blesser and we don't let the blessing become the goal or the focus. So he gives us these things to enjoy. He says to the rich, let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So we're to be rich in good works, we're to be ready to give, we're to be willing to share. Part of spiritual growth is learning how to ha handle money. And Jesus talked in a number of places about money. If you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in much. But who's going to give to you the true riches if you can't handle the earthly finances, Jesus said. We need to handle, he said, this, this unrighteous mammon that they may prepare heavenly habitations. So Jesus talked a lot about that. He talked about the rich fool who had a bumper crop. And he says, what am I going to do? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'm going to tear down the old warehouse. I'm going to build a bigger warehouse. I'm going to take the bumper crop. I'm going to fill the warehouse. Then I'm going to retire. And I'm going to say, soul, kick back, baby. We're looking good. And he said, you fool, your life is going to be required of you this night. And who gets all that? So is he, Jesus said, who is what? Not rich toward God. So that fool thought he made all this money so he can have this great life. But then Jesus said, tonight you die. You don't get to spend it there. But that guy had nothing up there either to be prepared. And so, foolish man, idiot. And he gets into the area, and you can read it in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, where God talks about us as believers giving of our finances. There's a principle that the Lord uses, and I say it's a principle and not a law. The health and wealth people will call it a law. It is not a law. A law is something that God would bind himself to. A principle is something that God generally uses. And the principle is this. If you sow sparingly to God, he's going to let you reap sparingly. Reap sparingly, not much. Don't give much to God. Don't expect God to bless you much in that area. If you're generous to God, then he will be generous to you. It's a principle. It's not a law. And the reason why it's not a law, because if you think, well, if I give God this much, then I should get that much. Now you're making it a law. And God may say, well, I'm, you gave me this much, but that much is going to be invested in eternity up there. So you're not going to see the return down here. That's going forward. Then you think, well, what a rip. My law didn't work. It's because it's not a law. It's a principle that God operates by. Generally, it's the principle that usually works. And I could spend the rest of the night talking about a variety of different times where I saw the Lord do stuff that just blew my mind. This last year, in our move from Northern California to here, we watched the Lord just pull off some stuff that it, it was cool. But, but he does stuff like that, and he wants to bless richly. And, and he does. But we have to be faithful to him as, as he has blessed us financially. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9 says that he gives seed to the sower. So when you sow your seed, you reap a crop, and you give to the Lord generously, he doesn't give you a crop back. He gives you a big bucket of seed. He says, go, plant some more. And you go, wow, that's four times the seed I had last time. You know what that's going to yield? Great. You go out and you plant that much, and then you get generous and say, thanks, Lord, you're a blessing. Thanks. And he goes, well, I thought that was a lot of seed here. Why don't you take 
Can't buckets of seed now? That's the, that's the principle he's operating by. When he says he gives seed to the sower, he, he blesses. And so he's telling us that, that we do it. And we're storing up for the time to come. Matthew 6, 19, Jesus said, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, because the moth won't eat it, the thief won't steal it, and the rust won't rot it. Things on the earth we all know are temporary, especially in the day and age we live in. Most of the stuff you buy has a stinking, cheap, cheesy little one-year warranty. Come on. You buy a refrigerator for $3,000 and you got a one-year warranty? That's it? That's it? There you go. Yeah, for, for, and that's the thing. So if you're going to buy a TV, you go to Costco because they'll double the manufacturer's warranty. Then you can buy an extended warranty for a really good price. And they're the only people I know who have that. I'll be there for four more days. That's the end of it. I don't get a kickback for that. But other than that, it's crazy out there, man. I, I bought a freezer. It's been a while back. And it had uh, a five-year warranty on most stuff. And then on the little um, compressor, it had a 10-year warranty. Pretty good for a freezer, right? I mean, what's going to wear out on a freezer? A door hinge? But the compressor, 10 years? Yeah. So I think in, uh, oh no, five years in the compressor, 10 years in the, five years and three months the compressor went out. I went to go get the same freezer. Yeah. One year on the freezer, one year on the compressor. Same freezer, same make, same thing. The warranty went from 10 years on the whole thing and five years on the compressor to one in one. And you just go, I mean, is your product that good? So the things on the earth, they're temporary, but the things in heaven and what we send ahead up in heaven, um, it, it's going to be good. So the Lord blesses on the earth, and he's going to bless in heaven. And so we just have to be wise in the way that we manage these kinds of things. Thoughts, Joe? Greed, isn't it? God becomes an investment. You know, for the purpose of an investment, that's why I give to you, God. You know, you give to the Lord, you just say, Lord, you give, and I just return back a portion of what you've given to me and leave it at that. And I don't even worry about it. I don't say, okay, let me see this. That was a pretty better one. You know, and what, you know I'm waiting for a return. Let me see. You know, here, or Here's my list, Lord, I, I gave to you. So I thought I'd go ahead and give you that list right there. You know, that's what I want now. For the wrong motive. Uh. Somebody over here was going to make a comment, I thought. Okay. Anybody else? Read it. Yep, that's a good one. It's a window text. But it can be. Yep. Yep. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, the, it, the, the Lord knows what we need before we ask. And that's the, the good part about it. So whatever we give and when we give to the Lord in finance, time, talent, service, whatever he gives back is going to be the best thing for us and what we need. And I, I think when he says, you know, with food and clothing, there with be content. And Jesus said, you know, Solomon wasn't dressed like the flowers and the birds. They're taking care of eating. He feeds them. He'll take care of you too. And then you look at the way he does and it's like, man, Lord, we are doing good. You know, when we think of clothing, you know, I mean, how many jackets do you have? How many sweaters do you have? How many pair of shoes do you have? How many pants do you have? How many shirts do you have? I mean, when I moved from Northern California over here, I'm just looking and going, oh my gosh. And I had gone about 
a year and a half before that and thinned out stuff that I thought, I'm just not wearing this one right here. I just, oh, but this is a good one. I, re- I like this, and so I'll hold on to it, and I don't wear it. So we got more than what we need. Chris? Yeah? 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 Yeah. Yep. 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 And we're in debt to him anyways. Or you see the homes they live in, and you're just going, wow, I've got a shed that's a lot nicer than that, you know. So we are blessed. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have blessed us very abundantly, Lord, and we pray that uh, in that blessing, Lord, that we're your tool, Father, to bless the needy, Lord, to bless the helpless, Lord, to bless the widow, Father, the fatherless, Lord, that uh, we are the ones that you've called to fund the work of the ministry of the church and the outreach and the mission field. And so thank you, Father, for just again blessing us Forgive us, Lord, when our motives have not been pure, when our hand has been tight. Lord, when we've kept our wallet to ourselves. Lord, just let us learn always when you speak to our hearts that we're to be rich in good works. You've been rich to us. Thank you for this evening. Pray for my brothers tonight as we head home. That, Lord, uh, our mind is on you, that we think on you, Lord, that uh, the old men would dream dreams of you and the young men would have visions about you. That, Lord, as we wake tomorrow, we'd be ready for a new day just to have that desire to go out and fight the good fight of faith, Lord, wherever you send us. Thank you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.